So we're having a centenary, are we? That's pretty special. APG just had one of those centennials not too long ago. And it gives us an opportunity to think about some important issues in our energy profession. So I want to thank Bob Webster and your team, Bob, for putting on a great convention. The conference facilities have been fantastic. The program is terrific. I want to thank Terry O'Hare, Terry and your team, for all you've done for the Southwest section. Thank you. So as Bob was giving us the introduction this morning, talking about the history of the Dallas Geological Society, it's pretty interesting because there are many basins that interest this group, including a lot of international basins. And I thought that would be really special. I think it'll be appropriate for the time we're going to spend together, because we're going to look at some of the world's biggest basins. And I think it's appropriate to do that here. One of the greatest things that geoscientists have is exploration creativity. That is one of the most sought after talents. There's a lot of complicated information but geoscientists have this magical way of integrating it and putting it all together. That's our gift. The people in this room, we're the ones that are responsible to bring this creativity to bear. And what's most important is we can integrate with engineers, with geophysics, with geochemistry. We're the problem solvers. People look to geoscientists to help do this. And what's more, when we look at a lot of analogs, as we'll take a look at some really interesting geology. I like pictures, so we'll see lots of maps and cross sections. We can anticipate places where these analogs may be put to good use. So some of you may know that I'm a book collector. I have all of the APG memoirs. We have several shelves dedicated at home. And two of the most outstanding ones are They document Pratt conferences. How many here have been to a Pratt conference or have looked at these volumes? Memoir 40 and Memoir 74. One by Mike Halberty and one by Marlon Downey. These books, that's pretty good. So we've got a, a good number of hints. At, in, they come, these conferences come every 15 or 20 years. And what I thought was interesting when I studied these great volumes was they were looking for new places to go and explore. And as I looked through the books, they were like, okay, here's all these new frontiers. But what I think is amazing about today is the paradigm shift that we're still looking for oil and gas in new places. But we're now, we have new tools with hydraulic fracturing and horizontal wells, with enhanced seismic imaging, with geochemistry and other techniques to go back to the basins they keep on giving. And so we've really, back to the future, we're going back to some of the world's greatest basins. And so we call these basins super basins. So let's take a look at a map. I didn't want to delay very long getting to the, the maps and cross sections. So here's the playing field. These are the greatest petroleum basins on the planet. Each and every one of them has the potential for revitalization. And many of them are already well on their way for revitalization. If you take these world's greatest basins and put an overlay, so the outline here, the light blue outlines are the approximately 30 of the world's largest basins, and you overlay them with the giant fields, you see that the giant fields cluster in these basins. So, there are about a thousand giant fields, and a giant field's 500 million barrels of oil equivalent or such. They're the ultimate prize for the explorer. And many in this room have had experience with giant fields. They are the one thing that is the greatest prize of them all. There are a thousand petroleum bearing basins. But what's interesting is you don't have one giant field in one basin you have 60% of the world's giants in about 25 or 30 basins. So the characteristics of these world's greatest basins, it's the petroleum systems, it's the geoscience architecture, it's the infrastructure, it's everything that goes along with the ability to access it. So they're highly clustered. So let's look 
for at the Middle East. If you look at the giant fields in the Middle East, structural fields are in green, structure, stratigraphic giants are in yellow. One thing you can begin to anticipate is how come there aren't any stratigraphic traps in the Middle East? Almost all basins have a good mixture of strat and struck. So if you're using your creativity and anticipation, you might say, well, there are underrepresented stratigraphic traps. And it just so happens next April, there's going to be a conference focusing on stratigraphic traps in the Middle East. And you might see a place like California that has a lot of structural traps. And I know several people who are uh, looking at stratigraphic trap potential there. And the North Slope has stratigraphic and combination traps, but not too many structure. So as you begin to look at the characteristics of the basins and the fields, you can begin to coax out some creative ideas. So these are the decades of giant fields through time. So there was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we had the most amount of giant fields discovered. But what's amazing is in the last two decades, and this decade's not finished, we're watching the wire now, and there's additional giants being found. There's a resurgence of giant fields being found, which is quite amazing because giant fields drive an entire ecosystem. The technology that it takes to develop a giant field benefits a lot of smaller fields around it and makes the infrastructure possible for an entire ecosystem of all fields. And what's interesting is some of the very large fields that are being found today were found before. But they couldn't get, they couldn't frack them, or they couldn't stimulate them. So fields that were found before that didn't qualify as giants are now being made into giants by the new technology. So we call those awakening sleeping giants. And so there's a whole population of those that are coming. And yes, we're working on the next volume where we have a lot of uh, interest and participation. So when I was an undergraduate, there was this phrase, and I'm sure many of you may have heard it, the best geoscientist is the person who's seen the most rocks. And that was my mantra. So I signed up for every field trip. I went on every, uh, every class that I could. And I think that that's the case for why we want to study giant fields. If we want to understand the world's greatest basin, if we want to understand fields, the more we look at, the more we better understand the task at hand for each and every individual. So this is a fun graph. This addresses just shale gas basins. And on this map, you can see North America has a, had a, is a fertile crescent for technology. Most of the resources that are being found unconventional have been in North America. But there's potential global. This is very exciting. We'll talk a little bit about the architecture in the Argentina. The first unconventional play outside of North America is going commercial, and it's in Argentina. And there are a lot of reasons for that. One is that it has a lot of support from the Argentinian government and the population. There is potential in Africa, Southeast Asia, Europe, and there's a lot of potential in Russia. We just don't have a lot of data for it at this point. So, as I promised, maps and cross-sections. And I used to sit, some of you may remember Mike Halberty, and I got to know him, and we used to sit when he, at the Halberty lectures at the annual conferences, and I enjoyed, enjoyed looking forward to it. We'd sit, and he critiqued the talks. And his number one criteria was if it doesn't have a map and it doesn't have a cross-section, he wasn't happy. He says, you got to have a map and a cross-section to tell a geologic story. So... That stuck with me and it served me well. And to that repertoire, I have added the event timing because it's more than just map and cross section for three dimensions. As we start to think about petroleum potential, we need to think in the fourth dimension. But with these three things, any geologist can tell a fairly decent story. So here's the prototype architecture of the Permian Basin. It is the onshore unconventional poster child for unconventional basins. And what you see in the map on the left, it's a big basin, big bowl-shaped basin with the center basin uplift, filled in by lots of reservoirs, source rocks down at the bottom of the pile, which is always a plus because that oil wants to get up, oil and gas wants to get up, a regional seal, a basin that hasn't been jostled too much, 
so that a lot of the oil is still in place. It hasn't been really broken up. And as you can see from the time chart, it got charged relatively early. And because it hasn't been jostled, most of the oil is still there. So that's a key element that you see again and again and again in the world's greatest basin. Something simple like that. And in this particular case, this is sort of fun. There's a late uplift. We all know about the laramide orogeny on the west side of the Permian Basin that tilts things. And so I'm really looking forward to Bob Trenum's talk tomorrow about the residual oil zone. Because as you look at other basins around the world, and we were talking about this last night at the icebreaker, there are a whole bunch of others that have left up late uplifts, like the North Sea, like basins in the Rocky Mountains. So whatever technology is able to prove on the residual oil zone, there are a lot of basins around the world that could benefit from that. So let's look at a fold and thrust belt. Here's our map of Pennsylvania, and here is the Appalachian Basin. Here's the deformation belt, and here's the non, largely non-deformed area. That's where the Marshallis Shell is one of the greatest gas fields on the planet. And here's a seismic line that shows the deformed belt at the Marcellus level, lots of fracturing and faulting, and a relatively undisturbed, this is a, a broad high, but this is where the play is being made. These slides are from Bill Zagorski, and the core in the highly deformed area has a lot of fractures and calcite, whereas in the area where the Marcellus is being played, is it's largely unnaturally fractured. So the hydrocarbons are there waiting to be hydro hydraulically fractured and produced. Another fold and thrust basin, we're flipping it around. Last time the mountains were on the east side, now the mountains in western Canada are on the west side. Big thick pile of source rocks deformed by the mountains. The hydrocarbons are cooked, multiple source rocks. The hydrocarbons are trying to escape in some places they do, and that's where the oil sands are, but in a lot of places they don't, and where they're, they don't escape and where they're overpressured. Very exciting in a fold and thrust belt for multiple plays in Western Canada. So some of you may know Alfredo Guzman. Does everybody, anybody know for Alfredo? Alfredo, a lot of people. Alfredo is a, is a good friend, and he pointed out his work, continuing work in Mexico and with Pemex, that there are some underexplored basins. So these references to the spray berry come from a paper, Pioneer uh, paper, that um, he worked on in 2002 with Chris Cheatwood, and it was looking at the spray berry. And what I like about it is the depositional environment, recognizing the lensatic sands, looking at how the spray berry is, and then anticipating, looking for analogs. Jacantepec Basin in Mexico, so down here in eastern Mexico, similar depositional environments, different age, but it doesn't matter because when you're looking for analogs, lenticular sands and a very big area. And one of the major differences are a large number of wells in the Midland Basin and very few wells down in the Jacantepec Basin. Now, there are above ground issues. Sometimes you can't always get access. But this is the kind of analysis I think is really exciting to look at and compare and contrast basins to ones that are successful and to ones that could be. And just to remember, we've talked about onshore. Let's talk about some of the great developments that are happening in offshore super basins. And for me, living in Houston, the Gulf of Mexico is a good, acts as a good prototype offshore super basin. And it's really made up of many sub-basins. It's a huge basin, 260 plus billion barrel oil equivalent out of the Gulf of Mexico. And Tom Ewing uh, is giving a talk tomorrow. I highly recommend, there you are, Tom, in the morning about the structural geology of, of uh, Texas and the Gulf Coast. This is a schematic cross-section showing the provinces above salt. Purple is salt. And there is a, an entire, over the last 10 years and more, there has been a major rejuvenation offshore Gulf of Mexico using seismic imaging to see things that couldn't be seen well before. And with advances in computer technology, we're getting to see this hidden province better and better and better. And it's very exciting because big things are being found. Now, one thing that's pretty cool, I think, is you look at the oil window, and Tom is showing here, 
that because of the transmissibility of the salt of heat, you might have thought that if you're going deeper than the oil, that this would be all gas. But interestingly, because of that transmissibility, you can still get in a oil window below the subsalt. Now that we have our creative thinking caps on, let's look at the Campos and Santos basins in offshore Brazil. Here's Brazil. Here's the offshore fields. So a lot of the early fields were found shallow in this these types of reservoirs above the salt. Here's the salt. And it's only been due to the enhanced seismic imaging to be able to see subsalt that a whole hidden province has been revealed. And so this has been a wonderful thing for offshore Brazil. You can see the Campos Basin here and the Santos Basin here. Under 100,000 barrels in 2007, they're now one point, about one and a half million barrels a day out of those basins. And Here's what's interesting. I was at a presentation where people, some seismic vendors were talking about doing shoots even farther outboard of the earlier subsalt discoveries. And what did I hear them say? You know, we're worried if we go outboard under the salt, it's going to be gas. But wait a minute, fellas and ladies. If, there, if we can take some lessons about the transmissibility of salt, maybe yet there's a whole other series of outboard discoveries to be made. So the geoscientists, we're the integrators. We're lucky to have toolkits. Here we integrate with engineers. Here's a diagram from Scott Sheffield. Everybody will be familiar with the sprayberry, the in, in deepening, the different vertical well techniques, progression in horizontal perfection, stacking horizontal wells. Here's an example from my good friend Cindy Yielding at BP on geophysics. As the computing power gets better, subsalt, you go from very difficult starting to see to much better imaging. And so that is a continuing um, opportunity. And I just got a few weeks ago, I was at the APG Hedberg conference in Houston, and I was with 187 geochemists and basin modelers. And I thought I was going to be out of my element. I have to tell you, those two days I spent, three days, were absolutely incredible because I came to realize. What a great contribution that geochemistry has made to all of our understanding, not just of the world's greatest source rocks by layers, their richnesses, their attributes, their distributions, and the oils. It's, it's, it has really been a major contribution to our science. And I, I have to tell you, there are so many great things that have coming out of the geochemical um, toolkit. So here is another graph from Scott Sheffield, the commercial efficiency of tall pay columns. So Delaware and Midland are quite well proportioned. We can see how they stack up against some of these other plays. And it's very critical in all of these plays to get the landing zone right. So I would like to draw some examples from the Bakken shale. And my good friend Bill DeMiss loves to show this example. In 1997 to 1994, in the early days of understanding about the unconventional plays, there were many completions done in the highest gamma ray source rock because people thought that was the place to complete. And of course, what industry learned in 2001 to present is that you need the most brittle place so that the high source rock intervals that have the juice have a, a transmissible zone. <laughs> So there was an evolution of the play in the understanding of what was the right landing zone. This was taken to great, there's a, it's a beautiful story. So Ryan Skinner, shown here, and Team Whiting were recognized by APG as outstanding explorers because they looked at the toe sets of the clinoforms, looking for the brittle lenses, and they mapped out these different silts and limestones using... And I, I love this. Anybody here who remembers Jack Elam? Orion Skinner made one foot contours of these little lenses and benches in a very flat intracatonic basin, just little ponded areas. But that's what drove the play. Those little benches were the keys to success. And so great work. Oh, and I do want to say one thing. Um, I think there may yet be a future conference on how well do we know our landing zones because there's a lot, 
you know, I don't know if anybody here has done analysis of dry holes in horizontal wells or underperforming horizontal wells. But I, since it's a very dynamic situation, I would not be surprised that there's a lot of room for perfection. And going back to some of the old plays that had early horizontal wells, did they get it right? We just looked at an example where they didn't. So the, here's the Vaca Muerta. So I'm told here's the mountain range, the Andes, and here's three major source rocks, the Vaca Muerta being the main one, but the two others. And I'm told that this is like Midland with really tall mountains in the background. So in August, Linda and I are going to the ice convention in Buenos Aires, and there's going to be a field trip to the um, Vaca Muerta, and we're going to stand here as close to the center of the basin as we can, and we have to get that photo of Midland with mountains. And the, the subsurface stratigraphy, we see planiforms again and again and again. These basins, what fill in the super basins are often, their star basins, you often see planiforms. That's why I'm really interested in hearing the talks this afternoon by Pioneer on what is the architecture of the Sprayberry and what is the architecture of the Wolf Camp. It's a little bit different, you know, more, more storm deposits and things like that. But in many of the big basins, planiforms are the name of the game and what is amazing about the Vaca Muerta package is my friend Robin Hamilton at Shell uses this phrase, and I kind of like it. It's the most seismogenic, unconventional play he's ever seen. Look at the detail that you can really image that play. And what, of course, is they're in the process of perfecting what are the landing zones. And I wouldn't be surprised that they're taking some examples from the Williston examples. And interestingly, I've heard that Shell uses remote drillers from Canada to drill their horizontal wells in Vaca Muerta. You can remotely log in. If so they have some of the technical experts. Think how exciting and global uh, an industry we are. You can tap into talent anywhere uh, remotely. Now, this is a fun example. And I, I have to do this just because it's a little bit humbling. This is the West Siberian Basin, map on left, cross-section and seismic line on right. Does anybody re recognize this little guy right here? Delaware Basin, Midland Basin, Center Basin, Uplift, to scale. Let me, let me just torture us a little bit. Oops. See if I bring it back. There it is again. What a basin. What are the elements of the basin? It's a very broad downward with a lot of source rocks at the base, a lot of reservoir package. There's a huge regional seal. And for the most part, you know, there's some warping to the basin, but it's a relatively simple basin. And it's a huge relatively simple basin that extends offshore. And some of the most recent giant fields, very exciting giant fields, are being discovered in the Kara Sea. Ah, so I learned, just to prove that I learned some things at the Hedberg Conference, so Alan Kornacki, one of the smartest geochemists I know, uh, said, you know, you should really inventory in the producing basins where there is a lot of production from known petroleum systems. As geochemists, we're always finding deeper indications of other petroleum systems. How well are those known and how well are those documented? So, for example, in North Africa and the Middle East, and they're pretty big provinces, they're mainly Mesozoic source rocks. However, <laughs> there's a huge Silurian system that's been recognized in the Middle East and also in Algeria. So there's a huge deep gas shale potential in North Africa. The North Sea, the Kimmeridge, we, we heard about that a little bit ago in the Upper Jurassic, the Kimmeridge source rock sources all the North Sea oil, except there's some Permian places where there's Permian source rock and Devonian. There are deeper, un, yet really underperforming petroleum systems. How great are they? How great will they be? Well, there's plenty to, to investigate. And I have to ask, because I know that we're focused on the Wolf Camp, as we should be, and I know that the Woodford is uh, productive at Alpine High, but I have to wonder someday, the Woodford and the Simpson in the Midland and the Delaware basins, whether somebody will go back and take a look at those things. Because 
quite frankly, they're great petroleum systems, right? If you know of any other places where there are potentially deeper, because I know there's a lot of global explorers in this room, and, and Bob Webster and I were talking about some in South America yesterday. If you know of some, would you come talk to me after the talk so I can add them to the list? So let's have a little bit of fun with the thing about the super basins are great petroleum systems and fundamental architecture. So that's the geoscience. The other thing that's great about these world great basins that are being revisited is their infrastructure. So let's talk a little bit about transportation. One of the great challenges for the Marcella Shell is it's a little bit complicated map. Oops. They're trying to build a pipeline across the Appalachian Mountains to get all of that Marcellus gas to the eastern seaboard where there's a huge market. And we all know in Midland there's a challenge to get all that associated gas out. So there's a lot of pipelines that are needing to be built. But for me, the game changer is what's happening, see if I can do it in a, in a slightly more creative way, in the blue space. How do you connect up all of these different continents? And of course, it's the LNG is a game changer for the world. We had a conference in APG in Africa, and uh, Denise Cox was there, and we were amazed at East Africa, the potential for resources that can now get to market because of LNG and Southeast Asia. And we had a program at APG about the Haynesville. That's the game plan there. Get that gas out because, see if I hit this next one, there's a price differential. Economics are driving the transportation. And one of the great benefits of the unconventional resources and the revitalization is we have relatively cheap energy prices in the U.S. I love taking pictures when I go to the gas station and like the prices are like, you know, they're up a little bit now, but for a while in our gas station, local gas station, around $2. At our natural gas, we have pretty, if you're a consumer, this, this is a huge benefit because some of the other places in Southeast Asia, like South Korea and Europe, pretty high pretty high gas prices, pretty high energy prices. We have a real benefit because of that. Now, a word or two about big data. And Shandell Sabo and Anna Darko, some of you may know her. She's a really great uh, leader in AI. And she doesn't call it artificial intelligence. She calls it augmented intelligence. And really, it's a result of the computing power. So we're managing all these incredible well data sets. We're able to do computer calculations, petrophysical attributes, enhance seismic imaging, particularly in offshore areas, and of course, develop all kinds of economic models. So we're going to hear about some of those here at this conference. So I want to take a play out of Scott Tinker's playbook, Energy, Environment, Economics. Let's look at the greater good that all of this geological understanding does for the world. So the first thing is, here's U.S. production. The per Oil and gas are way up, number one. If you look at the mixture, and this chart is oil on top, is gas is purple, so gas is this one, and here's coal in red coming down. So this is the differential for those who were at the leadership breakfast with Denise this morning. Here's the natural, clean burning natural gas replacing coal in the U.S. This is amazing, the impact this has done on CO2 emissions. I'll show you a chart in a minute. But this is a really great environmental thing. How about that? So energy, the energy mix is also contributing to the environment. And as Scott Tinker likes to point out, it's not just about the energy mix, but technology is enabling us to be much more efficient on the use of technology. I was able to go to the UT for the Energy Week, and they had a whole program on how Architects are designing more efficient homes, more energy efficient homes, more efficient everything. There's a whole industry out there that's looking at ways to be more efficient with energy. So there's a huge, that, that's part of the, the consideration for the energy mix. And then I like, this one's kind of fun because everyone talks about electricity and the importance of how electrical cars are having a big impact. So the thing here is Natural gas makes up the majority of the way we make electricity, and coal, a large part of it as well, about a, a third, a third, and it's growing for natural gas. So I was on a panel where people said, we don't need hydrocarbons 
we just want to plug our cars into electrical outlets. I need your help here. <laughs> we need to tell people, we need to share with people that it has to come from somewhere. And the more we can do with natural gas, the better it is for everybody. Here's the CO2 reductions because of that swapping out, which is continuing. So you can see we're, we've got some, something good to our credit, and then you can see some other places where they need some help. And I grabbed a few graphics. What I think is so great about the incredible underground geometries of horizontal wells, stacked horizontal wells, is look at all of this infrastructure below the ground. So this is, you know, there's some facilities here, but we're really taking advantage by putting a lot of the infrastructure below ground. Now, when all energy is helpful, but you can see there's a very different signature where the infrastructure is for some of the alternatives. But we're thankful for them because we need all the energy we can get. So the final part of the energy environment economic is the economics. This report I highly recommend by Michael E. Porter from Harvard Business School, 2014, America's Unconventional Energy Opportunity. If you haven't already seen it, please jot down a few words and Google it. You can download it for free. It's an incredible, so it's from Harvard Business School. And what do they say about the unconventional energy? It has done more to add GDP value to our economy. It has had a profound impact. The number of jobs and high paying jobs. Lynn and I had a chance to visit Range Resources out in the Marcellus. And we walked around to see these incredible facilities in the Appalachian Basin. There were a lot of young people with clipboards and hard hats and really good paying jobs that weren't going to be doing that if it wasn't for that, for that whole energy development. And same thing in the Permian Basin. A lot of, a lot of good opportunities for jobs and the benefits from low cost energy and the federal taxes. These guys at Harvard Business School, they quantified it and it's profound. So a few slides before we wrap it up. So we're getting close to the Apollo anniversary. I'm looking out, Bill DeMiss used to be. Are you still involved Bill, with the Astrogeology Committee at APG? Yes, Bill is still uh, involved. Big anniversary coming up. Our view of the world changed when this we first saw our planet this way. And our view of our energy use from space. If we look at about 20 years, I could just show one of these, but I'll show a quick time series. You can immediately see that there are areas in Africa, as Scott Tinker says, that are in energy poverty. And similarly, South America, places in Australia, large parts of Eurasia, you can see the rapid buildup. Watch how quickly India and China and places in Europe, they're still, we're still developing in these four-year time slices. You're seeing a lot more lights go on at night. But still, there's a lot of dark areas. So we have a lot of work to do. As Scott Tinker says, when we meet somebody and we sit down next to them and we happen to be on a plane and we're flying somewhere, and you ask somebody, what do you do for a living? And, you know, whatever they do, they tell you. And then you go, and they go, well, what do you do for a living? We can all say we lift the world out of poverty. What, now, what do you do again? <laughs> it's a noble thing. And I have to say security. All of this has had a huge benefit. So the big three are Russia, Middle, Mideast, Saudi Arabia, in particular in the U.S., so in the last few years, the U.S., well, 10 or 15 years ago, the U.S. wasn't even in the top three. We're back on top now. Now, if you look at the choke points for energy, there's a lot of places in the Middle East and around Russia where there's strategic choke points. So the more energy that comes from over here, as it now is by the United States bar in blue, the less there are subject to choke points. And as Scott Tinker says, no form of energy is perfectly secure. But as we all know from our investment portfolios, if you have a balanced portfolio, you're spreading the risk. So it's important to have 
more than just oil, gas, others as well. So now here's a point that drives to professional societies and technology transfer. I had the opportunity to talk to represent from Chevron, Exxon, BP. These people are in, these companies are in 10, 13, and 16 different basins. So all the, of the world's greatest basins, the super basins we talked about, these companies have a big footprint. And I said, how do you take the learning? How do you take what you learn in one basin and optimize it so that you can share it? And interestingly, they rotate people through. One thing they do is they give you a position in the Permian Basin. They want you to learn about the prototype areas, and then they try to transfer you around. Very, very ingenious way they do it. They also identify centers of excellence that represent different types of super basins and the processes and the methodology. So that's how they handle it. I want to give a shout out to service companies. Do we have any service company reps in the room here? I, thank you. Service companies work with more basins in general. They have the opportunity to work with a lot of clients. They see a lot of things. They have been a major, there's no, this energy renaissance without them, without our exhibitors, we, we appreciate their help. They see things that they share. Oh, yes. And then finally, APG conferences and publications. And you're going to see in your bulletins in the weeks and months ahead and years ahead, we're going to have a series of papers on the world's greatest basis. We have about 10 of them committed, and we're hoping to get 15 or 20 or 25 or 30 so that when you look at your bulletin, you'll have some really landmark papers on the greatest basins in the world, the general facts and figures. So a couple of highlights about events. Here we are today. This is in just about a year, there have been 12 events that have focused on the Super Basin theme. This, I'm counting this luncheon as one of them. We've had the inaugural conference just over a year ago. We had a second conference just a few months ago, and a shout out to Mike Party, because we did a, the first one was global. The second one was really a deep dive of what does a prototype Super Basin look like? And we're planning to do another global basin in February. So just, you know, a few months from now, we're going to have a session in Buenos Aires in August on Latin American super basins. And we're hoping to continue broadening the conversation in March 2020 in Middle East basins and possibly also China and Southeast Asia. And bringing this knowledge back to APG members. And I love smiling faces. <laughs> And many of you are in these photos. These are what, photos from some of the events that we've had on Super Basins. This was the one at Salt Lake City for the annual convention. And I was pretty pleased that we had the room well attended. So here are some of the great minds. This was the, the Global Basins in 2018. Here's the speakers from 2019. So I'm trying to think of a pyramid here. So building on this foundation, the February 11th of 2020 super basins. We're going to pick up a lot of basins we haven't already talked about. We're going to focus on the plates and the tectonics and source rocks and pure chemistry and some of the key things that make the basins work, the commerciality of the basins, uh, LNG, hydraulic fracturing engineering, geophysics. All of these will be part of the next program coming in February. So this is the final slide. And Everyone's seen this slide because I showed this as my presidential address in Salt Lake City, or you may have seen me give it before, but I like to use this slide with students. And I asked them to make a prediction about here's the Permian Basin, prototype, mature basin. Here's the Golden Age back in the 70s. And I remember as I worked in the Permian Basin in these various areas where 3D, we were all excited about 3D seismic and reservoir characterization. And, you know, we were just, as Denise Cox likes to say, and thank you, Denise, for this slide, we were just managing the decline, but we all kept looking back at, boy, these were great days. If only we could go back to them. Well, I asked the students to make a prediction, of course, you know, we play around with rulers and things, but of course, we know that the world has changed. And I love to point out that the golden age 2.0 is better than the golden age 1.0. And I know there are still challenges ahead, but this is very exciting because what this means is there may yet be future. Who knows where this will go? But there may yet be future peaks out there. And so 
as I talk to students, I, I've had an opportunity to visit with a lot of the old wildcatters. I mentioned Mike Alberian. I've had uh, talked to quite a few. A lot of them talk about this book, The Fascinating World. Is you, do you remember this one? Anybody? Yeah. A lot of people went in the 60s and 70s, went into the oil business because this book told them how exciting the energy business was and how it benefited society. And it was a primer. So the only change I would make today is we're broadening. It's not just oil. It's, it's all the other types of energy and particularly natural gas, the fuel of the future. So when I talk with student groups and uh, we have a few students in the audience but what I always remind everyone, by Jim and Claire, be a part of the energy solution. There's a lot of ways to contribute. Be a lifelong learner for those of us who have been doing this. What you start out, you've got to keep learning because there's um, computers, geochemistry, the, the things in our generations, you know, who knows what they'll be. And oh, by the way, APG can help with the education part. I have to point that out. And yes, be proactive in your professional societies like Dallas Geological Society, APG. And when people ask you to volunteer, say yes. <laughs> what have you got to lose? And you have a lot to gain. Make a lot of friends. I can't say no. Congratulations, DGS, on the dawn of your second century. Let's get off to a great start. Let's make it a great one. Thank you.